I think we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second episode of Weekly Hope this week. We're very, very glad that you're here. I'm Kirsten. I'm the host of this interview series. And do you see this little white fluff ball? This is my unofficial co-host of the show, Elsa. She uh, is always up here to say hello to all of you. Hey. <laughs> um, we hope that wherever you're joining us from in the world today, that you're having a bright, beautiful, blessed day. Um, just going to tell you a little bit about what we do here before I introduce our guest who's on the other side of the screen there. So Weekly Hope is a weekly Facebook Live interview series where we bring on guests from across the spectrum of mental health and specifically eating disorders to talk about a wide variety of different topics. Every week, something a little bit different. Uh, as I mentioned, we had two episodes this week. Usually we're here on Wednesday, but yesterday we had a bonus episode. And uh, you can find all the information about past shows on our Facebook videos page, as well as on our YouTube channel. We have an Eating Disorder Hope YouTube channel where you can find all of our previous episodes, as well as this one, which will be uploaded in a few days. But um, what we just love to do is have conversations. And we know that eating disorders thrive in isolation and um, in uncertainty and not knowing. And one of the most helpful tools in the recovery process is getting more information about what these illnesses are, what recovery looks like, and to get encouragement if you're on that road or if you're a loved one supporting someone in recovery. So we just love to start the conversation. And also we invite you to be a part of that. So obviously one of the great things about Facebook is that we can do this and invite your comments. We wanna hear from you. So uh, those of you that have been watching this for a long time, you know, just pop in and say hello. We love to see who's watching. Tell us your name, where you're from. Uh, it's really cool. We get people that tune in from all over the world. So we, we love to, to hear from our international audience as well as those in the United States. So pop in, say hi and take the opportunity to ask questions. This is a super safe space. And one of the cool things to see has been over the weeks that people often get into conversations encouraging one another in the comments in ways that either of us never could, either myself as the host or the guest. So this is your opportunity to share your heart, your story, to have your voice be heard. And of course, every time you share it can potentially be uplifting to others who may be watching and reading the comments as well. So that's a little bit about what we do. I'm going to introduce our guests who we're very, very fortunate to have here today and our topic. So over there on the other side of the screen, we've got Dr. Catherine Godwin. She is from Laureate Eating Disorder Programs um, and she has got an extensive bio. So I'm going to read a little bit of it for you. It, that's a, this is why I say we're really, really lucky to have her because she's an expert. Um, so uh, Dr. Godwin has served as medical director and attending physician of the Laureate Adult Eating Disorder Program since 2010. She joined as medical director of outpatient services in 2008 and was the medical director of Laureate's independent living program for outpatient eating disorder care, Magnolia House from 2007 to 2010. She's practiced at Laureate since 2005. She's, a board, she's board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. She received her medical degree from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and completed her residency in psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, where she served as chief resident. Dr. Godwin shares her expertise locally and nationally, and today virtually, about <laughs> psychopharmacologic considerations with eating disorders. She's an advocate for patients and families and encourages her patients to participate actively in treatment and to work together with their care team for optimal symptom management. So Dr. Godwin, what else have it, have you not done? I, I think you covered it. Um, so at, at Laureate, I'm on the, um, I'm the medical director and the um, attending physician for all the patients in the adult program who are on the acute, the residential, and the partial care level. And then um, when patients do go to Magnolia House, which is our, our outpatient level of care where they also live with us um, in a supported living environment, they uh, work with Dr. Terry Human during that time. Uh, one of my colleagues I've worked with for a long time. And if they're here with us on the adolescent program, they work with Dr. Scott Milsman during that time. So um, I, I know some different people who are in the field know different names in that set. So that's who we are here at Laureate. And, um, and it has been um, as long as 2005, as I hear you say it. So, <laughs> um, so here we are in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, and that's what we do. Um, yeah. 
Wonderful. Yeah, I know. And we've had guests on from Loria before and you guys do a really wonderful job and we very much appreciate your time because as medical director, I know you're extremely busy. Um, so we're going to dive into a really interesting topic that we have not talked about before on this show. And it's something that you've presented on before. So I'm really excited to get your expertise on this. So it's the topic is how genetic variation impacts antidepressant efficacy in eating disorder treatment. And so there is a, a large conversation in the field and for people in recovery about the use of medication and treatment, but you've done a lot of research and, and presented on some of the findings of how genetics and this burgeoning field and more and more study and research being done, um, how that affects medication and the intervention of that in treatment for eating disorder recovery. So I'm really interested to kind of open this up and get your insight. So first of all, um, what led you to look into this topic more. What was your interest in exploring the genetic component as it relates to eating disorder treatment? Absolutely. Um, so in the world of general psychiatry, without even specializing down to eating disorders, but just general psychiatry, this is a really exciting time for genetics. And patients um, are being directly marketed to, to look at their genetics regarding how they're going to respond to different medication classes and which um, how their bodies are particularly going to metabolize medicines to have the medicine work well for them or have side effects or too much or too little. And um, because people who have eating disorders have the same risk of developing any other um, psychiatric condition and they have the same um, liver profile um, risk as anybody else does and most meds metabolize through the liver. Um, these questions are just as applicable to patients in the eating disorders um, treatment field as they are to anybody else in the general psychiatric field. And in addition, when you have when you have malnutrition contributing, all of a sudden the building blocks that your body's genes and your body's liver will be using to make a medication useful or not are being manipulated by the eating disorder. So that's a secondary but very significant factor that is unique to patients with malnutrition, whether the cause is the eating disorder or um, a poverty situation or um, a gastric illness or some other reason why somebody's um, nutrition is being significantly impacted, but it does impact their body's ability to take in medication and respond to medication. So it was the same general factors for anybody in the community to look at genetics. And then it was specifically how does malnutrition impact their ability to respond to medication. Yeah. And um, there are so many barriers already to somebody who is wanting to get the best care possible for their eating disorder recovery and whatever we can do to understand the barriers and then um, address them. I, I think that's in the best interest of all of our patients and loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad that people in the field of eating disorders are contributing to this, this study and bringing, um, you know, bringing it more to the forefront in the treatment process. So um, you talk about in, in your presentations that you've given before in the um, great PowerPoint deck that uh, you sent over that I got to, to look at beforehand, um, which as a non-medical person was like, whoa, I can't wait to have Dr. Godwin on to actually explain this. Um, but talks, you mentioned it just briefly, but um, specifically the phase early on in the recovery process. Um, why, um, why is medication not necessarily um, useful or helpful during the starvation phase of eating disorders when a lot of people first come in, especially if they're very acute. Absolutely. And I do want to briefly say that this applies not just to people who are visually in starvation, but people who are using behaviors that limit their body's access to nutrient building blocks, regardless of what their body looks like. Um, so atypical anorexia nervosa, people who are having purging behaviors, people who are doing extreme exercise behaviors, people who are um, doing any of the variety of behaviors that qualify for an eating disorder, they have some of the exact same risk factors for having medications become ineffective for them or not be effective in the first place mm -hmm. as somebody who has the traditional research anorexia nervosa. And when I go through the reasons why those medications are shown repeatedly to be ineffective during the acute phase of illness, some of those individual reasons will become apparent as to like why that also applies to somebody who doesn't have classic anorexia nervosa, but may have atypical anorexia nervosa or a binge purge subtype or bulimia nervosa eating disorder 
or, or a variety of different mood disorder behaviors. I think it's really important to recognize we're not just talking about something that's visually under the arch. Yeah, no, um, I, that's, so, yeah, um, that's so sad. No, I just wanted to drive home that point. It's so important. And if anyone's listening to this and thinking, oh, well, I'm not sick enough or thinking that that has something to do with their medication, that it has nothing to do with how you appear visually or your body size. Yeah. So I'll, I'll actually skip to my slides in my head and say that uh, in women who are normal weight but are just engaging in dieting behaviors, the level of serotonin that's available in their brain fluid is measurably reduced within one week of dieting behaviors. Wow. So obviously that has nothing to do with where their body weight is, just dieting behaviors within one week of behavior. Wow. Um, and, and, and how it comes together is when your body is using antidepressant medications that act as serotonin reuptake inhibitors or norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So this is almost every primary antidepressant medication and therefore almost every primary anxiety medication too. Almost everything you would take for major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder. So Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Lexapro, Celesta, Christy, Suspect, or Cymbalta, the yeah. primary antidepressant. Um, these medicines rely on your brain already having serotonin, norepinephrine, and or dopamine in good abundance um, in the brain fluid because the way they are effective is by making those neurochemicals that are already available and being released act longer. So if your brain isn't already making those in good abundance, then no matter how much medication you're taking, there's no target for that medication to act on. And the way that your brain can make the serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine and have it in good abundance is if you're well nourished. Because tyrosine and tryptophan are your basic amino acids that you get through your food intake, that your body then processes through multiple steps to make it into serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So if you're not eating food groups that give you tyrosine and tryptophan in good abundance, you're not getting serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Mm. So automatically, whatever your nutrition is, if you're blocking out certain food groups or you're just not getting it in good abundance, you're not getting the neurochemicals. And your body doesn't prioritize those neurochemicals. It doesn't want you to be happy if it's getting a, a portion of the neurochemicals or of the tyrosine tryptophan that it needs. It will use the tyrosine tryptophan to do other key features in the body to keep muscle groups strong, to keep the heart strong, to keep other um, organ systems functioning it's only going to take care of the brain chemistry when you're very close to ideal body weight. Mm. So as somebody is working on their nutritive healing, it's only as they come very close to reaching whatever their body's goal weight is, their individual body, not what a doctor's chart might say, but their individual body's goal weight. It's only as they get very close to that does their brain chemistry start to prioritize the serotonin chemicals, the norepinephrine chemicals, and the dopamine chemicals to be there in a way that's going to make their medication act optimally. Mm. That's so amazing. Can you do you know off the top of your head some good tryptophan foods? Um, I do. In a diet, turkey. turkey. More, but turkey. <laughs> Everyone knows <after>. turkey. <laughs> so, so your basic animal proteins are an excellent resource. Um, so automatically, somebody who's doing a vegetarian or a vegan diet is going to need to look very carefully at where are they going to get those resources met if they're not going to be getting animal proteins um, in their meal plan. And then um, if they're going to get it from uh, vegetarian proteins in general, they're going to need about three times the volume of high quality vegetarian protein as they would from animal protein. And if you have an eating disorder that requires you in your disorder to limit your volume, or to spread whatever volume you are eating over other variety of nutrients, it's gonna be really hard for you to get all the key nutrients that you need over the limitations your eating disorder is imposing. Gotcha, S super awesome, thank you. Um, so okay. besides the nutritive component that you mentioned, what are some mm -hmm. other reasons why uh, patients, let's say there has been an intervention of medication with a psychiatrist, um, but they come to you and they say very commonly, I feel like my medication's not working and that might lead to them stop taking it or something like that. What are some other reasons why um, someone might feel like their medication isn't working? Well, if their medication was working and it was working in the context of being nourished and then they became um, more symptomatic within their eating disorder, 
it may be that as they became more symptomatic in their eating disorder, the nutrient base fell out underneath their eating disorder or fell out underneath their medication. And so their medication became progressively less and less supported within their neurochemical structure. And so the medication, which was effective, became less and less effective as their eating disorder presentation became worse. Mm. So that it, um, the medication could have been helpful, but became less helpful. It's also possible if they were just starting a new medication, um, that that medication may just simply not be the right fit for them um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one, their body may individually not get that medication at the dose that they're taking to a level that's therapeutic. And so in medical school, we learned that a medication needs to be taken for four to six weeks at the therapeutic dose before we can evaluate whether or not it's going to be helpful. So for a common antidepressant like Zoloft, Zoloft often starts at 25 milligrams and needs to be increased to 50 and then 100, and then maybe 150 or 200. So we're talking about five uh, adjustments in the dose of that medication before we can say whether or not that medication is going to be helpful for you as an individual. Because mm. if you took it at 50 milligrams and you said, well, I took so often it never worked for me. Well, maybe 50 milligrams is never going to work for you. Maybe 150 is going to be your treatment dose. So you may count off Zoloft as, nope, Zoloft doesn't work for me, but you never had a therapeutic trial of it. Mm. And were you nourished when you were taking it? Yeah. Um, and this is where uh, gene testing can come in as, does that help guide us in our selection of medication choices? And um, there are a lot of people who have opinions on this, including the American Psychiatric Association has an opinion on this, and they put out an opinion paper this year. And their opinion paper says that while there is increasingly good science, um, that the, the science behind gene testing is driven right now through the business market more than through the scientific market. Mm -hmm. And so what's being released right now and sold directly to consumers is a little too young. It's being released a little too early for broad use. And so again, this is the American Psychiatric Association's opinion. Um, but they did say that there is good data in it. There is good science behind it. And that when you take that gene testing that's broadly available and you apply it to certain patients, it may improve um, overall drug selection and therefore overall outcome. And so the APA is recommending that patients who um, have had either previous uh, multiple drug trials without positive results, that they may be somebody who would benefit. Um, or somebody who is really struggling with a severe illness and um, could not afford more time doing additional trials, but really needs to focus in on, uh, on a more sincerely rationalized uh, trial strategy sooner because of the severity of their illness, that either of those reasons might be a reason to trial sooner. But um, that's for generalized pain testing, um, just, with, just like larger panels. But there's a specific part of gene testing, um, the MTHFR, that a lot of people are hearing about. Um, MTHFR is a gene that has to do with helping your body convert the folic acid that you're either getting in your daily vitamins or in your prenatal vitamin or in the food you're eating. And that's your leafy greens, your legumes. Again, dietitians, feel free to chime in with your long list of options. <laughs> Yes, if anyone's got a good list of folic acids that you want to contribute in the comments, we'd love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> These are dietarily resourced. When you take them in multivitamins or in your prenatal vitamin, your body has to transfer them through one step of liver processing them into what your body would get from vegetables or from your food. And then your body has to take them through multiple other steps to make them into the thing that is active in your brain. And the thing that is active in your brain is actually part of the gatekeeper to help your body take your amino acids and make them into serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine. Mm. So this MTHFR is a really important pathway of helping you take your nutrients and your foods that you're eating and make your neurochemistry work. Mm. So in patients who have genetic um, shifts, um, where their body doesn't do the MTHFR step well, this is a really well-documented gene site. We know that if we can supplement folic acid through L-methylfolate, which is just one step past this gene site, then um, we can get a significant improvement in 
brain chemistry to be available in order to help their medications work much better for them. So somebody who's previously never responded to Zoloft or Prozac or Paxil or any of those, um, if they got their MTHFR tested and found out that they had a genetic deficiency there, if they supplemented it L-methylfolate, they could go back and take those same antidepressant meds and maybe have a significantly different response to those same medications. That's so cool and fascinating. Yeah. I, that's so cool. Um, so if someone's hearing this and like, hmm, maybe I should get that test. Um, and you mentioned about the difficulty of these things. Now maybe they're coming to the market too early. They're being marketed directly to consumers. Someone's listening to this and they're in an outpatient setting, for example, they're not in a residential program. Should they go to their, um, to their psychiatrist or to their doctor and ask for a gene test? Should they do that themselves? So um, quite possibly, yes. Um, the MTHFR can be tested separately from the rest of the gene testing. And at a site like Gloria, we can just throw it on your standard Monday lab. So I can just write to the MTHFR separately and um, send it in. And um, almost universally, um, insurance companies are covering that without difficulty. Just recently, we had an insurance company send it back and, and do non-coverage. So we're in communication with them about what's the shift? Why are you not covering that? Because otherwise, it's been well uh, received for several years now as being important to be evaluated. And then if it tests positive, you never need to test for it again. It's a gene. Um, it doesn't shift or change. If you're positive for it, then you need to supplement at that site that's just past that gene marker. And um, that's a long-term recommendation. Gotcha. That's so interesting. Okay. So if you're listening to this and you're watching this now or later or on YouTube, um, super important information. So rewind and get that again from Dr. Godwin. Um, so do you have any examples? And I know we talked a little bit about this before and you're like, actually I have an opposite example. Um, <laughs> but uh, examples of patients who have responded significantly better to the combination of therapy and medication as a result of getting a gene test. Yes, so I will start with the opposite <laughs> example yeah. that I mentioned earlier. So we had a young woman on our unit who was really suffering with the combination of her eating disorder and her OCD, and in that combination also self-harm. So a very complex patient, very difficult to respond to treatment and really uncertain if she wanted treatment. Um, and for her, she'd already had the gene testing done before she came here and we were using um, a, an antidepressant, an SSRI, that uh, the gene testing said she should respond to just perfectly, just as anyone ideally would. Um, but there's gene testing, which is how should my liver metabolize this med? Should I get the blood level expected for the dose I'm taking? And then there's actual blood levels. So there's something called therapeutic drug monitoring, where I can say this patient is taking Zoloft or Prozac or Lexi. And I can take a, a sample of their blood, send it to the lab, and have the lab send back to me on this dose at this time of the day, their blood level is blank. And I can compare that blood level to a sample, um, an established number um, of where people should be on this dose so, ever, so many hours after they take their medication. And that doesn't tell us whether the medicine will work for them or not, but it does tell us, do they have a blood level as expected? If their blood level is as expected, then I think their liver is processing the medication as expected. If their blood level is way higher than expected, then I expect they might have more side effects than usual, and they should be getting efficacy from medicine. It should be effective for them if it's going to be effective, because compared to everybody else who's taking 100 milligrams of that medicine, their blood level looks like 200 milligrams. So I may not want to increase the dose for them. They've already got a really high blood level. Hmm. Somebody else though may have 100 milligrams as their daily dose, but their blood level looks like they're taking 25 milligrams a day. And then that tells me, all right, so 100 milligrams a day is not gonna be effective for them because their blood level looks like 25. I need to go back and ask them, are you definitely taking it? Mm. <laughs> you know, Did we test you on a week where you ran out of the medicine or, or some other thing was happening where we didn't really get a good test? But if you're definitely taking it, then your liver is metabolizing that medicine so fast that you cannot get a blood level. Um, so for this particular young lady, she was taking Zoloft and her blood level on 100 milligrams a day looked like she was taking 25. 
because of her own anxiety, she wanted to stay on 100 milligrams or she wanted to stay on Zoloft. So we had to keep bumping up that medication, bumping up that medication. And finally, when we got to a very high dose, much higher than is usual, she finally got a blood level that looked like the usual maximum of 200 milligrams a day. And on that medication dose, she finally got a really positive response um, to the medication. Her symptoms really improved and she was able to make a lot of progress. But the actual number of milligrams she was taking of the medicine was way above what I would ever have prescribed for anyone without mm -hmm. having testing to show me that she was not absorbing that medication properly. That's so interesting. So my yeah. question is for, um, for someone who's just going in and out of an office with a, a psychiatrist and they maybe feel like their medication isn't working or something like that, can they go to their doctor and request a blood test so they can, how, how does someone who's not a residential treatment benefit from something like that? Because my mind just explodes with all the people out there who might be at the totally wrong dose. And so the intervention of medication is just not working for them. Yeah. So there's a level, um, you know, I never get to see the patients, even when I was doing my outpatient psychiatry, I never got to see the patients who would go to their primary care, get five or 10 milligrams of Lexapro and they feel better. They never came to see the psychiatrist. They yeah. stayed with their primary care. They'd be great. The psychiatrist gets to see the person who they've done one or two med trials with their primary care. They've not responded well. They get sent on to see the psychiatrist in the outpatient setting. So um, I know that there are not enough psychiatry resources across the nation, but we really do need to think about who needs to see the psychiatrist and who can work with their primary care to get their psychiatric needs met. Just like do you need to go see the emergency room if you have a head cold or can you see your primary care for that? Mm -hmm. um, so we need to have people seeing a psychiatrist if they cannot get their psychiatric symptoms under good control with their primary care doctor. Yeah. Um, because this is a higher level of assessment than just um, just what you might do with your primary care doctor. It's not something that people are trained in in the psychiatric titration of medication at the primary care level. Yeah. Okay. But awesome. yeah. once you're working with the psychiatrist level, then being able to have the discussion of how, um, how comfortable is your psychiatrist with doing um, gene testing and utilizing that? But then outside of gene testing, including if your insurance doesn't pay for it, the therapeutic drug monitoring, getting the blood level, that right now might even be more useful because it's not the theoretical idea of how will my body process this medication. It's how is my body actually processing the medication that I'm truly taking as yeah. I'm taking it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so empowering. And so I want to encourage if anyone's listening to this, um, to just, yeah, you are your own best advocate. If you're in an outpatient setting like that, um, you know, talk to your psychiatrist about this. If you're questioning it, um, take it to them and be your own advocate and use your voice. Um, because there's so many tools out there to make sure that therapy is really working for you. Um, so these are last few questions and I know we've gotten some new people that have logged in and stuff. So if you've got any questions, now's your time to ask them, or if you're just sitting and enjoying, continue to enjoy. Um, but, uh, so one thing I want to address before I ask my last question is there are probably, there are some people out there who have fears about taking their medication or complying with the program, or maybe stepping up a level because of things like the stigmatization of medication, um, the fear of getting addicted, uh, mm -hmm. of being on a medication forever, so to speak. If I start taking an antidepressant, am I gonna have to be on it forever? Can you dispel some of those fears if people have them? Yeah. Um, so one thing that we want to talk about is the, the risk versus the benefit of having treatment in the first place. Um, I don't think people give enough weight to the risk of not treating their depression or their anxiety. We know that untreated major depressive disorder, the more days of your life that you spend with a major depressive disorder that's not being treated, it actually is neurotoxic. It kills brain cells mm -hmm. and the brain loses mass um, over the more days of your life that you have untreated depression. And it, it adds up over the course of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. We know that patients um, who experience more days in their life with untreated major depressive disorder fall in their socioeconomic status over their life that their ability to, to reach and maintain their full potential and their, their work life, their relationships, et cetera, that it declines. Mm -hmm. We also know that not treating depression and anxiety to its fullest potential um, is associated with increasingly difficult to treat 
depression. Mm -hmm. So that if somebody has a depression that is not well treated, um, that it lingers. So that makes the depression increasingly hard to treat. So we really want to be more aggressive early in the treatment of depression mm -hmm. rather than waiting to treat it later. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who has a family history that includes a lot of depression and they've had depression themselves, it's important to know that once you've had one major depression in your life, you have a 50-50 chance of having a second episode. Mm -hmm. And once you've had two episodes, you're 80, 85% or better of having another episode. Once you've had three episodes, you're 90, 95% or better of having more episodes. Mm -hmm. And so getting better treatment earlier and really completing your treatment is shown to be much more protective. Mm -hmm. um, the data is that treating the, the first and earlier episodes of major depression for at least a full two years before you come off whatever treatment it was that made that um, depression improve is shown to be more associated with maintained recovery, whereas stopping treatment before two years is associated more with relapse. That's, thank you so much for hitting that so hard because I think that we are so used to having that attitude toward physical health issues, but we don't, for some reason, um, our culture hasn't treated mental health the same way. So thank you for that <laughs> perspective. Absolutely, and too many people settle for partial symptom improvement. Mm. I feel better than I did, so I'm just going to wait and see. Instead of really wanting to get fully better, um, and, and you're, you're right, I think it is the bias about physical wellness versus mental health wellness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yes, being more aggressive in treatment at the time of the illness is going to predict a better long-term outcome and recovery than a more passive approach early in the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, just if you had a broken bone, you wouldn't say, I'll wait and see how my body heals this. And then maybe it's three or four months from now, I have a noticeable limp, I'll get a cat. You would never say that. Yeah, right. Exactly. You'd go immediately to the hospital. I know someone. I know someone <laughs> who might be watching right now who, oh. who recently broke a bone in her leg and went straight to the hospital and got surgery. And now she's doing very, very well. <laughs> she knows who she is. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, oh, and I see we've got also Deborah Schlesinger says, good morning from California. Hey, Deborah, it's great to see you here. Thank you. Um, so last question, if, if someone is watching this right now um, and they're in the recovery process or they're a loved one um, who's trying to support someone, what advice would you give that supporter and what words of encouragement can you give someone in recovery? Um, I would say that in eating disorders recovery, along with depression and anxiety, you um, need to prioritize the treatment of the full person. Nutrition has to come on board for depression and anxiety to really have the ability to have full response. Um, some people will say, I want to treat my depression and anxiety first, and once that's better, then I'll have the motivation to treat my eating disorder. But as we talked about earlier, the malnutrition undercuts the depression and anxiety responding. Mm -hmm. So we really um, do have to treat the whole being. And that means our nutrition has to get um, well-founded for the depression and anxiety to be treated. And that is um, the best way for us to support somebody who is looking at their treatment opportunities and how to best engage themselves is looking at themselves as a whole person and their treatment as an embracing um, themselves that way, that each part of their body needs to be nourished, each part of their uh, relationship and experience needs to be nourished for them to have their best opportunity to respond to treatment. Also, that if they are looking at that, that step and maybe a recommendation for higher level of care, whether that's stepping up from standard outpatient to an IOP or from IOP to an inpatient track, that when outpatient providers make those recommendations, it is only because they are feeling um, that that is what's necessary for somebody to get back to their normal life sooner. And it is not, um, not at all to take somebody away from the power of Decision making, but it is really to hand the power back to somebody sooner. And our 
our position in working with somebody is to kind of circle the wagons, to use an Oklahoma phrase, to circle uh-huh. the wagons around somebody and provide them the support that they need to confront their eating disorder until they are feeling that they can confront their eating disorder and that they are empowered to make the choices they need to in their recovery and they can take that back to themselves. It's not to, um, to take the, the power and authority away from the person, but just to support them in their recovery decisions until they're able and, and are ready to consistently do the work they need to do for themselves. And I think so many people are fearful of doing recovery because they fear that they will lose control or authority um, of their own decision making. And it really is to come together as a team and a community with them and to hand that authority back to them just as soon as they are ready. Mm. So good. And also that really they think they're giving up control, but when you give up or choose to participate with your treatment team, you're actually getting your power back. Very well said. Yeah. Cool. Well, Dr. Godwin, thank you so much. This was so empowering and educational and informative. Thank you so much for breaking this down for us in a way that was easy to understand. And hopefully people have something now that they can move forward with some more education about this really, really important topic and they can use it um, with their treatment team and with the support of professionals to make the best decisions for their care. Thank you so much. Yeah, cool. Well, thank all of you for watching. Um, And please, please share this uh, because This is just so many nuggets of brilliance here that was just shared. Um, So if you have someone who is working with a psychiatrist that you know um, in eating disorder recovery, um, working with the intervention of medication and treatment, please share this video with them um, so they can hear some of this and be empowered as well. Um, Thank you so much for watching. Um, We are actually going to be on another break uh, for a couple weeks from the show because I am getting married. So um, I am going to finish planning my wedding and go do that thing. Um, (laughs) So uh, I am going to be celebrating my wedding and honeymoon, and then I will be back in October. But um, we really hope that wherever you are and whatever place in the recovery journey that you're on, that, um, that you have a healthy couple of weeks, that you choose to love yourself and commit to recovery every single day because you are worth it. You deserve quality care. And to just reiterate what Dr. Godwin said, um, that early intervention is key. Don't wait. Take your health, physical and mental health, seriously, because we just get one shot at this and we just have one body. Um, And Sarah says, congrats. Thanks, Sarah. Um, We just have one body and this one life. And let's treat ourselves with the dignity and value that we deserve, that we were born with, that comes with us, baked in. Um, You're beautiful and special and unique and wonderful just the way you were created to be. So, all right, with that, I'm gonna say ciao. Have a wonderful rest of your day, a wonderful week, and we'll see you in October.